And today, tonight's scripture is John 5, 1 through 18. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jer Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Beth Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But, he replied, the man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Thank you, Brenda and Tiger. Yeah, it was great to see Janet. The other, the other day, she, the day she f uh, fell, she wasn't communicative, but just a day's a night's rest, and she was, you know, back at it, smiling and sharp as a tack. She didn't have complete awareness of where she was, but, um, but still, her humor was there. Um, she, she didn't think she was in Cape Cod Hospital, and Jim said, "I bet you a nickel you're in Cape Cod Hospital," and she said, "I'll bet you five nickels." <laughs> so she was. Um, it was just a joy to still be around her and to see her humor come out and her smiling face and um, continue to pray for her and also pray for the, the Gage family as they uh, care for her. We've been in John's Gospel. This will be the last sermon for this series. And don't worry, I'm putting a bookmark in John's Gospel and we will pick up right where we left off later. Um, maybe perhaps next year and the new year we'll, we'll pick it back up again. But we've been seeing something uh, similar, every passage that John is uh, presenting to us, that there is um, an idea of who Jesus is, and then there's the actual Jesus, the, the real Jesus. And as people approach Jesus, they all have their own ideas about who he is and, and what he ought to do. And uh, Jesus uh, rearranges uh, some things for, for us. And, and if we'd receive him for who he is, it, we'd actually be really changed. And really blessed to set aside our own ideas and to see what he has to say for himself. Well, I'm sure you've heard it said, don't meet your heroes. Well, I never knew what that meant until I met one of my heroes. Because when you meet your hero, you, you then think, oh, that's what you're really like. And your wonder vanishes. For, because you see their humanity for what it really is. But when we meet Jesus, the opposite happens. We realize how much more magnificent he is than we ever imagined. The closer we get to Jesus, the more awe-inspiring he uh, shows himself to be, and we become wrapped up in his glory, and everything in our life all of a sudden gets put into perspective the right way. That is, of course, if you realize the significance of who he is, you see, some people miss Jesus altogether. 
they can carry on a conversation with him. They may even see unique and amazing things that he can do, yet never realize the significance of who he is. We saw that happen in our passage. Perhaps it's something like the TV show Undercover Boss. This show is, is, is where wealthy CEOs and founders of companies go undercover to work alongside the minimum wage employees of their company. And they're disguised as a trainee, and they're being trained on the job. Sometimes they get in trouble because they can't do these simple tasks. But as they're working alongside the bottom-level employees, the employees are talking to them about struggles in their life, how they can't afford community college or something simple like that. And at the end of the episode, there's the big reveal. The boss comes out, and the trainees come forward and say, wow, I was actually talking with the, the CEO the whole time. This is kind of like what we've seen in Jesus' life so far, except Jesus isn't in disguise. He's plain for all to see, just waiting to see who might recognize him and come to receive eternal life, which he can offer. Remember back to John 4, what he said to the woman at the well. He said, if you knew who you were talking to, if you only knew, you would ask him for living water that wells up to eternal life. This problem persists today. You and I are at risk of missing the real Jesus. As we go to church, read the Bible, go through religious motions, we might be missing Jesus all along. And in doing that, we might settle for a humdrum spiritual life that we have, not realizing the founder of our faith has been with us this whole time. And he has the ability to bring new life like we've never imagined. Whether your spiritual life is dead altogether or, or just simply growing stale, if we can see Jesus for who he really is, we can find the rest and healing we really need. That's the main idea coming from this passage. That if we can just see Jesus for who he is, we can find the rest and healing that we really need. The question is for each of us, do you want to get well? Do you actually want to get well? In our passage, we see two types of people who miss the real Jesus. I wonder if you can relate to them in any way. Well, the scene opens up for us at a pool. This is a public pool just outside the gates of Jerusalem. There were uh, columns holding up roofs around this pool, and there are masses of disabled and, and diseased people lying all around. They were all there because they believed the water had healing power. As the man told Jesus, when the water stirred, the first person who gets in gets healed. It was probably that the water was fed by uh, a fresh spring of water, kind of like the type of water the woman at the well thought Jesus was offering her. And that whenever this fresh water rushed into the pool, some people believed it was being stirred by a celestial being who gave the water healing power. Now, Jesus is in Jerusalem because it's an annual feast, and he passed by this pool. He sees a certain man lying down and realizes that this man has been paralyzed most of his life, perhaps all of his life, so 38 years. Life expectancy for a woman at that time was maybe around 35 years, and for a man, no more than 40. Jesus asks him a strange question, perhaps a bit rude if you knew it was Jesus. Do you want to get well? Of course he wants to get well. The man doesn't even answer the question directly. He essentially says, it doesn't matter if I want to get well or not. I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. Others always beat me to it. Now, perhaps in saying that, he's hoping that Jesus will be such a friend to put him into the water when it's stirred for a chance at healing. I think back to the show Undercover Boss. So many times... These um, employees unwittingly tell the CEO something like, I'd love to go to community college. I just don't have the money. All the while talking to a millionaire, a multimillionaire perhaps. And they say, but anyways, can you hold the doors open while I get rid of these boxes? If you only knew who you're talking to. Jesus responds to the man um, by saying something even more strange. Get up and take up your bed and walk. The water hadn't stirred, but something stirred in this man. 
and he felt strength and life and warmth that he hadn't felt in 38 years. And he got up and he took up his bed and he walked. Well, the man was undoubtedly excited and blown away by this experience, although the narrator doesn't say anything about that. It seems he just, he goes on his way caught up in the significance of his healing without ever realizing the significance of the man who had just healed him with just the word. Because later, the religious leaders will ask him, who, who was it that told you to pick up your bed and walk? And he didn't know. Never caught his name. I wonder if any of us here are at risk of missing Jesus in a similar way, of being uh, blessed by Jesus even, and, and appreciating and enjoying blessing that comes from him, and yet foolishly going on our merry way without ever having connected with him personally. This is a real possibility for us, for people in church. We see it described in a sobering passage from the letter called Hebrews. The author writes this in chapter 6, that it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of this coming age, who have, and who have fallen away, it's impossible for them to be brought back to repentance. Now, one day I will preach through this book and I'll take uh, time to do my best at explaining all of this. But for our purposes, looking at John chapter 5, I just want to point out a single observation here. The author in Hebrews is encouraging people in church to press on to full maturity, to let the Holy Spirit work in their life to his full effect so that the eternal realities Jesus is bringing will have their way with us because some people get a taste of these things but fall away. Even though Jesus had given the man at the pool a taste of resurrection power that Jesus will one day bring in full, the man missed out on Jesus. One of the funniest memories I have as a kid is being over at my cousin's house for his birthday. So all the boys were probably between 7 and 10 years old. And I'll never forget the scene of him and his brothers getting uh, birthday cards, ripping them open, opening them up, finding a couple bucks and going, yeah, and throwing the card away and then picking up another card, opening it up, seeing if there's anything, passing it on, opening up the next card, ripping it open, cheering for the money that's there and then going to the next card. Without any concern that someone might have written something personally to them in the card. Church, don't do that to Jesus. Do not be like this man in John 5. When the Pharisees approached him to see who it was, he, uh, he had no idea. He, he perhaps forgot all about him. And the man's dullness is illustrated all the more in that when he finds out who it was, when he sees Jesus later, he just goes right back to tell these religious leaders who it was. He throws Jesus under the bus. Didn't connect the dots. They didn't like that. So here's the million dollar question. How do we know if we've missed the real Jesus? How do we know if we've missed him? The answer comes by implication. When Jesus bumps into this man later in the temple, Jesus said in verse 14, hey, you're well again. Here's another strange thing Jesus says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. My hope is that the man's dullness would have been broken in this final exchange and he would uh, begin to see that there's, there's something more to this Jesus than meets the eye. But we don't know how he responded after that. But what we do know is what Jesus tells him here, that there is something worse that can happen to him. There's something worse that can happen to you and me than being paralyzed for 38 years. There's something worse that can happen to you than being paralyzed for 38 years. And it comes as a result of sin, as Jesus says. Well, it's been told already in John 3, 16. God loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Implying, if you miss Jesus, you will perish. Verse 18 of chapter 3. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. 
But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the something worse than being paralyzed for 38 years, eternal separation from God, in condemnation on account of your unconfessed sin in light of his holiness. So how do you know if you've missed the real Jesus? You know you've missed Jesus when you are more concerned about your body than your soul. Are you more concerned about your body or material things in life than your soul? It's easy to think about those things. It's easy to think about our aching back, our debt, our, our looks, or our lack thereof, our, our career. But do we ever think about our soul? You need to know that there's something worse than having a bad back or carrying a load of debt or not being liked by others. It's losing your soul because you let Jesus pass you by. He was right there you didn't even think to catch his name. Why don't we do that? We know the truth. We're, we're not half as good as other people think we are. We know what's in our hearts. We know our inner thoughts. We know the crippled condition of our soul and the ever-deepening debt of sin. What are you going to do about that? Do you want to get well? Some of us are just so lost in our pride and sin that, that we wouldn't know we met the real Jesus if he slapped us in the face or miraculously healed our 38-year paralyzed body. Perhaps you've been with us in church walking with Jesus in his word, reading of him and seeing him in action week after week, and you miss him every time. Rather than coming to him for true healing, you're happy to take whatever you might be able to get out of God and toss the rest aside like an empty birthday card. Do you want to get well? Don't you want to get well? Don't let Jesus pass you by. Don't miss him. He hasn't come down uh, to beat us down with rules and magnify our shame. He's actually come to take this burden from us and to put it on himself. For he is gentle and lowly of heart. He's come to redeem us from both the penalty and the power of sin. If we would only receive him for who he is. I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad I've been able to get to know you all personally. And, and I'm happy for you all to forget about me someday if you only would, would meet Jesus. You can forget about me if you just don't miss Jesus. Don't forget what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 18. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Now, the problem of the man who was healed is actually quite similar to the problem of the religious leaders who are all up in arms about Jesus breaking the Sabbath. I can talk about people who do not acknowledge God and profess their faith and, and their need to do those things, and, and we in church can shake our heads and say, yes, pastor, those people do need Jesus. Let me tell you about my uncle. But what's striking about this passage is that it shows us how religious people have this problem too. Those who believe they are in might only be fooling themselves all the same. Religious people are just as vulnerable, if not more so, of missing Jesus. Look again at verse 9. The, the end of verse 9. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And as we saw, the religious leaders were quite upset with a man telling other people that they can pick up their mats and walk. What was the deal with the Sabbath? The Sabbath was a weekly holy day of rest that God gave to his people. They were supposed to do all of their ordinary work in six days so that on the seventh day, all of their work could be done and they could worship God uh, with clear minds and a full heart. How practical is that? Just think for a moment, for, for a minute. How, how distracted we, we are sometimes when we're in church, thinking about all the things we need to do. Well, imagine if we had just done everything so that we could actually worship God with a clear head and a full heart. Now, the Sabbath was written into their law codes that God had given Israel in the Ten Commandments. We read in Exodus 20, and it pointed back to what God himself had done as an example in creation. He made a creational pattern when he made the world in six days and rested on the seventh. 
These Ten Commandments served as a general framework for life as God's people, and we later find in the Old Testament more specific applications and instructions for how the Sabbath was to be applied to the Israelite culture at that time. Now, at that time, the Israelites were an agricultural people, so you know they had animals. But number two, they were, their religious life required animal sacrifices, so they even had more animals. So, here's a quiz. What if your animal fell in a ditch on the Sabbath? There's perhaps no greater care that you needed to give than care for your animals if you were an Israelite in that time. But yet there was probably no more work exhausting than the get your donkey out of a ditch job. So would you be allowed to do that on the Sabbath? God's law for them said yes. In fact, it says, if your neighbor is the one trying to pull his donkey out of a ditch, you need to go help him. Why? Because one law above all others was to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know that that did not come from Jesus in the Gospels? That's Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. For however strict and important was the Mosaic law, it could be reasoned with by the law of love because God is love. God himself provided these provisions for his people so that they could exercise wisdom and love for the circumstances of ordinary life where the law did not have a clear instruction. But would this provision that God had given ever be sufficient for religious legalists? No, of course not. It would never be enough. As time went on, the leaders of the Jewish community would provide their own instruction for people regarding how the law of God ought to be applied to their ever-evolving times and culture. It was in a work called the Mishnah. Now, this was necessary to an extent, but they had lost all perspective on how the law of love reasoned with the law of Moses. That's why when the religious leaders in John 5 find the man who had been healed, they're so consumed by their self-righteous pursuits of keeping their own traditions, they do not realize the irony dripping from their judgment. Rather than highlighting the rest of uh, the the rest that the Sabbath brings, they actually burdened people by their Sabbath regulations. They knew the Sabbath was meant to be a day of rest, but they couldn't see the long-awaited miraculous rest that this man had just been given. They were so concerned with the man going around telling other people to pick up their mats and walk that they blew by the fact that this man was healing them of their paralysis altogether so that they would never be uh, needed to be carried again on a mat by his friends. Not to mention this all happens at a pool called Bethesda, which means house of grace. The religious leaders had no grace to give any of the invalids that day. But later in John 5, the very next passage, the, Jesus tells them exactly what their problem is. He says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have life. But these are the very scriptures that actually testify about me so that you would come to me and find life. He says in John chapter 7 to them, Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? Because Moses gave you circumcision, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. He's giving an example here to show them their hypocrisy. You circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath, which is work, so that... The, the law may not be broken. Why are you angry with me for healing a whole man's body on the Sabbath? He says, stop judging by mere appearances. Judge correctly. There was no greater purpose for the Sabbath than to do the type of thing that Jesus did, but they were blind and could not recognize the significance of Jesus. He was the son of God. Would that they had come to him so that they could find healing and rest that even they needed healing and rest for their souls. What about for us as a church? We believe God exists. We, we believe that the Bible is God's word and that through it, God still speaks today. We believe that the Bible tells us 
what we are to believe about God and what duty God requires of us. And yet despite all of that, all that we believe, our pride can commandeer our religious zeal so that we totally miss the point of what we believe. And what's worse, we can live at odds with what God himself is at work doing, both inside and outside the church. When it comes to God's work outside the church, we looked at this a few weeks ago in John 4, to see that God is actively involved in seeking true worshipers, and he's doing that in people that we happen to be around every, every day, people who don't even go to church. Wanting to be seen as good, law-keeping Christians, we can be caught looking down on such people because of the overt sin that might be protruding from their life. But by doing that, we would show that we're missing the same point that the Jewish leaders were missing. That to be a law keeper actually means to be a burden lifter. To truly be a law keeper means to be a burden lifter. If we are commanded throughout the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, to love our neighbor as ourself, then to be a law keeper means to be a burden lifter. The Apostle James writes this. This is my translation. If you say you're a law keeper, but you're not a burden lifter, then you're only fooling yourself. You might be keeping someone's law, but it's, it's not God's law, that's for sure. What greater burden could you lift from someone's shoulders than to show them your love when everyone else might be writing them off? And what's more, for that love you show them to open their hearts that they might receive the good news of God's love for them through Jesus where he's promised to lift the burden of our sin and shame because of what Christ has done for us. How easy it is for us in our self-righteous zeal to live at odds with what God himself is at work doing. What about for matters inside our church? We can live at odds with what God himself is doing inside the church too. To find out how, we, it might be as simple as just asking what we find annoying about church. Does the music annoy you? Does the preaching annoy you? Does the size annoy you? Does, does our building annoy you? Do, do, do people around you in church annoy you? Does it annoy you that kids run around after church without any awareness of anyone else? The list of examples could go on. Now, there are always going to be ways that we, as a church, ought to consider how we can grow in our spiritual health and maturity. And actually, we all, as members of the church, are responsible to work towards that. But as we do, and as we're in process, could we just step back and see the fact that God seems to be happy to work among us anyways? even while we're less mature or less healthy than we could be. God seems to be happy to work among us anyways, despite the things that we might find annoying or a problem. If we did step back and humbly look at God's hand of grace all around us inside this church, we might find it. We might find God's grace. And the legalist inside us might die just a little bit more. And we might be changed just a little bit more to reflect the very heart of Christ for our church and those around us. What burden could have been lifted? What greater burden could have been lifted on the Sabbath day than the burden of being paralyzed for 38 years? Let's get out of our own way and just take a second to consider what God might be doing right in front of us as we are before we continue just to pass it by in judgment. The question is, do you want to get well? Do you really want to get well? Will you be healed of your pride and let the glory uh, of the work of God among us, both inside and outside the church, soften your heart? Whether you are a religious person or not, whether you call yourself a Christian or not, this passage shows us that everyone needs to be changed by meeting the real Jesus. So who is the real Jesus? As I've said every week, this is the question of John's gospel. 
which we have seen bits and pieces of in every passage. But nowhere up to this point in his gospel uh, has it been answered so explicitly. And it is answered by the mouth of Jesus himself at the end of our passage. Let's, let's conclude by looking at the final verses of our passage again. Jesus was telling people they could pick up their mats and walk on the Sabbath. He was going around healing people and helping people in all sorts of ways. Who does he think he is? In his defense, Jesus subtly reminds them of something they themselves confessed, that the Sabbath is not an unbreakable law. To say it positively, the Sabbath is actually a breakable law. For, as the Jews believed, God himself works every Sabbath. God rested after making all creation as an example for his creation to follow, but it was a commonly held belief among the Jews that God actively sustained all creation by his power, thereby working each and every Sabbath. Jesus is saying something that all the Jews believed. God is always at work, even on the Sabbath. The problem with that is Jesus said he is also at work. Therefore, he is making himself equal to the only person allowed to work on the Sabbath. What's more, Jesus calls God his father. And they rightly understood it as Jesus making himself equal with God as every son has the same essence of their own fathers. Yet the religious leaders never connected the dots. Who could have had the power to heal a paralyzed man in full with just the word, but God, the creator of life? So in their hardness of heart, they grew harder and colder. And at this point, they didn't want to give Jesus a hard time anymore. They, they wanted to kill him. And this will be a turning point in John's gospel. We'll see how the narrative progresses next time we pick up John's gospel. But let's just close and consider this question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? If you do, there's good news for you. God is always at work. And today he has been at work in Forestdale Church, revealing who Jesus is through John chapter 5. So that we might come to him and find the rest and healing we really, really need. If you're not a Christian, don't let Jesus pass you by. Come to him and receive the healing of the forgiveness of your sins. And church, let us not let Jesus pass us by either. He's still at work even now by his spirit. May we not get sidetracked by peripheral matters, but rather celebrate his work and enjoy the rest that he gives us today. Let's take a moment now to pray. If you would just consider what God might be saying to you and offer that back in prayer to him. Father, we thank you so much for this evening to gather again as your people, to enjoy your beautiful creation and the lives that you've given us to live here at this time. Thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy and will continue to enjoy the next few minutes. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit, who has opened our eyes to show us who he is. We thank you again for your grace. Would you renew us evermore into it? Would, you, would we come to you and find rest? It's in Jesus' name.